I'm not used to Well, welcome, to it. man. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Um, Thanks for having me, Finn. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Yeah, you too, man. You too. So uh, this is the third interview in this series that I, I thought of a few months ago, a few months ago called Musicians Workbench. Yeah. Um, so for people on Instagram and people watching, if you haven't, if you don't know about this, basically it's, uh, it's just a way to connect with musicians and community members and also raise awareness about certain organizations that are near and dear to the hearts of the musicians in the hot seat, uh, which is Alex today. And uh, we had Ross Holmes a few weeks ago and then Bronwyn, Keith Hines, and now Alex. So welcome, Alex. Thank you. Great to be here. Cool, man. Well, I thought, uh, I thought we would just start, if you could just give a little bit of your background musically. I think um, sure. people would be curious. You play a few different genres, so I'd be curious to hear what you started with. And then just a concise, doesn't have to be so concise, story of your journey. Yeah, well, I um, guess I got my first fiddle when I was three and started taking lessons when I was four. So um, I guess there is a, a little, oh, I'm hearing the echo. You hearing that too? Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'll try moving my phone away from the S. There was a period of time where I was just kind of messing around on it um, before I started taking lessons. And then um, I started started off with Suzuki lessons which um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Suzuki is a method for learning classical violin, but it kind of emphasizes ear training um, before note reading. So it kind of went hand in hand with uh, fiddle tunes, which, and uh, I started taking fiddle lessons around the same time, just learning basic fiddle tunes. And um, that kind of led into, um, getting into the Texas style side of things, going to fiddle contests. And um, that was, I guess that was kind of my first, that, those were like the first musical events I remember going to that got me real excited about music. Um, so, so Texas contest music and classical, those were kind of the first two genres you started with? Yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, at, at that point, I wasn't thinking of it as like contest music or classical or like even them being different things. It was just kind of, you know, I, when I, um, I grew up just hearing a lot of music played around the house. So I'm, I feel very grateful for that, just being exposed to a lot of different styles at an early age. And, um, but yeah, I guess that's kind of, that's kind of where it started. And the, you know, I was never super into the contest side of things. It was it was enough of an incentive to work hard and practice, and that was good. And I'm really grateful for that kind of structure that it provided. But I never really, honestly, like never really cared that much about the contest part of it. Um, but what I did care about and what I did end up loving more and more is that tradition of fiddle playing and mm. meeting some absolutely incredible fiddle players from that from that world. Um, and that was, that was really influential and really got me into, it got me into improvising, um, and which eventually led to getting more into jazz and bluegrass and that kind of thing. Is there a pretty big contest Texas style scene out in Oregon where you're from? There is actually, there's a pretty good scene out here. Um, for sure. Yeah. I, I grew up going to the Oregon state fiddle contest. And okay. there's, there's a good scene there. I haven't, I, you know, I haven't been to a fiddle contest now in probably about a little over 10 years now, which is crazy. I've been trying to make it back to like Weezer. It, it's just never, it's never worked out, but, um, right. Weezer and again, not, not for the contest part, but for the hang and like, you know, sure, Weezer, yeah, yeah. Weezer, especially, I don't know if, have you ever been Finn? No, I mean, there was like that genre of music. I didn't even know existed until I was probably 16 or 17. Okay, like, yeah. Where, where I'm from in North Carolina, it's 100% old time bluegrass. There's right, right. no Texas music. I mean, maybe there is now, but when I was a kid, I never yeah. heard anybody playing it, so. Okay, yeah. So yeah, Weezer is kind of just as much of like a festival as it is a contest, you know? And there are right. people who go and camp out who never even like walk inside the building where the contest goes on. Right, so, okay. I just loved the whole scene. And that was kind of like the first like festival I went to 
And then like a few years later, I started going to bluegrass festivals and all that. But, so when did you get into bluegrass, speaking of that? Um, well, I always, I always heard it around. My, my dad plays bluegrass. Um, and when I was fairly young, I started going to jam sessions with him, playing with some of his friends. And at that point, I was kind of like, mostly like kind of coming from more like the Texas style, Texas swing ish, I guess, um, side of things. And I had heard some bluegrass fiddling, but I didn't quite know like stylistically what it was about. I just knew it was like fun. <laughs> and it was like, these festivals were cool. Um, I mean, I love that because you said the same thing. You said something similar about classical and Texas music, which most of us would think are very different genres. But you said earlier that to you is just music. Like you were, you were less concerned about the genres and more just the music. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, I've always thought about the genres in terms of like the, the traditions and this, the different like nuances that come, come along with that. Um, and I think it's important to think about that stuff, but at the same time, kind of, I've, I guess I've always just kind of been attracted to the music I like, and I'm not too concerned with like what the genre is, is in terms of like, you know, whether I'm drawn to it or not. Well, at some point, I do want to talk to you about your thoughts on genre, because you play a few different genres, and you play each one really convincingly. And so I think people would be curious to know how you practice genres in a way that you know it doesn't sound like an Irish player playing bluegrass or a bluegrass player playing Irish or whatever it is you know yeah um in fact there's like uh for those that don't know uh Alex is one of the fiddlers if not the fiddler for life from here with Chris Thiele uh, one of the fiddlers one of the fiddlers okay <laughs> and there's a great uh I saw a clip where Chris Thiele's like and Alex is going to start off a fiddle tune and most people who know you as a bluegrass fiddle player and then you kick into Dexter Gordon or some bebop tune <laughs> which uh is a was a great fiddle tune but <laughs> as if to say like you're just as comfortable in in jazz and as you are in bluegrass and Texas probably and other stuff so um but before we get there tell me about um when jazz came into your life and and when you decided that you wanted to start studying that more seriously yeah well I guess it was kind of, it came out of being into like Texas style, Texas swing fiddle playing and bluegrass, because both, both of those traditions um, have quite a bit of improvising involved in them. So it was kind of just like, a, for me, a natural progression getting into jazz. I mean, one of my first fiddle heroes was Johnny Gimbel. And to me, he's just as much of a jazz fiddler or violinist or whatever you want to call it as, as much as anyone you know totally. and you know he's thought of as more of like a you know western swing fiddler I guess but when you hear the way he plays over a standard it's there's so much bebop influence and swing influence and the way he combines that language with kind of more of a Texas style old-time fiddle bowing approach is really brilliant and that I think that was kind of that might have been like the first big one for me. It was like hearing Johnny Gimbel, hearing the way he would improvise over these tunes and like how he was opening up the harmony and the chords in a way that I hadn't really heard before. Hmm. And that was like the gateway, you know? And so then from there, I got into a lot of like the older swing fiddle players, um, like Stuff Smith and obviously Grappelli and Django and um, Eddie South, people like that. And then I kind of just worked, gradually worked my way forward chronologically, naturally, not because it was what someone told me I had to do, but mm. it was, you know, I and I had great jazz teachers who were, you know, hipping me to a lot of people, but um, I kind of, I'm kind of glad that I never had anyone who was like, oh, you have to learn the, this, like, the bebop language and, like, earn your rite of passage or whatever. Like, I kind of just, um, I remember I first heard I remember when I first heard Giant Steps by John Coltrane, I couldn't hang. It was too, it was just too out there for me. Hmm. And then after about a year of like getting really into Charlie Parker, I remember I went back and listened to that record and it just totally blew my mind. So, you know, sometimes I feel like we all have these like gateway artists. Or yeah. musicians, or, and not, not gateway in the sense that it takes away from their significance, but it's just like one person, one musician opens the door to the next 
in terms of like sound or language or something that you may have not been able to access before, you know? Yeah, I, and what I found is like, sometimes those gateway artists make a giant circle. It brings me back to the- Absolutely. The first artist. Totally, yeah. So you, so you got into jazz through Western Swing, Johnny Gimbel and, and that music, and then you went off to Berkeley and you studied jazz, right? I did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in a, uh, this program called the Global Jazz Institute, which was kind of like a jazz performance program within Berkeley. Um, and it was, it was a pretty small program. So I got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the, you know, the teachers who would come in. It was directed by the pianist Danilo Perez. And then he brought in a lot of other guest instructors too. And that was just a really incredible experience, especially as a violin player, you know, just that's for, you know, in that music, I think the best way to learn is to be able to be around people like that who, you know, generally violin is not part of the picture in that kind of music. There, of course, there are some major exceptions, but um, so I was the only violinist in the program and my, my violin teachers were outside of that program. So like when right. I was working on jazz in that context, it was all with, you know, pianists, drummers, horn players. So how did you think about the violin differently than studying this kind of music, which doesn't have like a violinistic reference point? Yeah. Well, I will say that Billy Contreras was kind of the, he was the gateway for me in terms of that, just okay. realizing what this instrument can do and how it can actually fit in that context and be appropriate and not be just kind of some novelty of, of jazz violin, because there's often a lot of novelty with that term, you know? Sure, sure, uh, sure, sure. And uh, Billy just, and still continues to just blow my mind whenever I hear him. I mean, he's ridiculous, <laughs> as you know. He's ridiculous, he's a genius. Yeah. Man. yeah. Well, I would imagine like, um, so some of the, you know, studying Billy and, and Billy, Billy probably inspired you how to learn other non jazz styles of music, which also don't have a violin or fiddle in them. You know, you absolutely playing with Danilo, who's a Latin jazz player. So you played Latin music, you played other forms of music where the violin is maybe less present. So, uh, at this point, like, and you live in New York, when you know there aren't pandemics right around. so <laughs> and in new york there's so much different music so how do you um do you have like uh like a philosophy about learning other styles of music that are less like fiddle heavy or do you approach each genre on a case-by-case -case basis or any thoughts that's a great that? question you know and, and I'm, I'm always trying to figure that balance out because i think especially for people of our generation musicians of our generation you know it, and I have this, this discussion with my friends all the time. It's like we have access to everything, which is incredible, right? It's like anytime you want to listen to music from any part of the world, you can, you can find it. Right. And, that, and that's amazing. But if, on the flip side, it's, it almost kind of devalues everything in a certain sense. And, it, and it's like it's almost too much of a good thing. So um, I struggle with sometimes just feeling like I'm pulled in so many different directions because I love a lot of different, I don't, I don't like to use the term genres, but you know, whatever you want to say, I love a lot of different traditions, styles of music. And I'm always trying to find the balance of, you know, just appreciating music from afar and just acknowledging that it really moves me and I'm inspired by it, but I'm not going to like literally try to learn it or play it and just mm -hmm. trust that it will work its way into my musical voice somehow versus you know, something that I hear and I just absolutely have to learn and incorporate. So right. I, I feel like it's always a balancing act and you just got to find a way to kind of prioritize too, because it's like, at the end of the day, you got to, you know, structure my time to where I'm like improving things that I already feel confident about and like, you know, honing in on my strengths while always checking in with new things and, you know, trying to fill in the gaps and, you know, always trying to find that balance. On that point, do you have a practice regimen, something regular that you do, or um, how do you practice? I, you know, I, I've, I've always gone through phases with it. 
it's I've never I've never had like I've been trying to play every day during the during the quarantine and practice every day um but as far as what I actually practice that's definitely not consistent at all and you know maybe I'll go through like a week of kind of staying staying with something um or the, you know there might be like I've been trying to transcribe a lot lately and learn solos so then I you know I'm going to stick with something that I'm learning until mm -hmm. I know it but as far as like exercises are concerned that I kind of go through phases with that and at this point I'm trying to just accept that that's who I am I yeah. I think for a while I've I've been kind of in denial of that cuz you know there are so many inspiring practicers out there who I talk to and who uh you know I hear talk about music and so, so many people have very structured approaches which is really inspiring to me but for whatever reasons I just don't seem to operate that way do you think that that's because the kind of music you play and you play lots of different kinds of music but it's more um it's maybe less about technique per se as yeah like I don't know there's there's always this conversation between like the violin and fiddle worlds like yeah uh, about what makes them distinct and among the many definitions that aren't a joke um, or punchline, <laughs> right. I've heard that, um, I think it was actually Duncan Wickle that told me this, that like, and again, this is his opinion, but like the, the purpose of a fiddler uh, is groove. Mm. And um, whereas a violinist is much more concerned just about tone production or just the, the quality of sound, whereas it's, you could, you could almost boil it down to quality of sound versus quality of groove. Uh -huh. And that's obviously an oversimplistic definition, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about this, the, the sound tone side of things, because I feel like all my favorite fiddle players are like very conscious of their sound. And that's like such a big part of it. But I do think that at the end of the day, the groove, the groove factor is kind of what, what makes it different. Classical music is not a groove based style of music and that's not that's not a put down it's just saying it's like it's obviously inspired by dances and groove based music but it's not on the it's not on the groove grid you know what i mean right on the x y axis yeah and and a yeah. lot of groove music is very it is elastic and not to say it, it's all quantized but you know what i mean and and it's like it's like a certain way of subdividing like that's what i find when teaching classical violinists it's often the thing they have a real hard time with is subdividing with the bow almost like you would a pick mm -hmm. on a mandolin or guitar you know right and that way of relating to rhythm in a more kind of constant percussive kind of stream like way i feel like is something that classical violinists have a hard time with so you mentioned um i would agree with you i mean on your point that like good fiddlers you know can also have great tone obviously the two aren't mutually exclusive and, uh, and your point about like the fiddlers that you admire that are very conscious of their sound, um, that, that, got, that got me thinking about like, do you have musical, like a musical code of, I don't wanna say ethics, but like things that are important to you musically, like, like when you're editing a recording of yours, it's like, no, like that I wanna leave in because that is important to me. Like that sounds like Alex. Yeah. You know, I don't, I definitely don't have any sort of strict code. So it's, it's, I think it always comes down to just intuition and what feels the best. I, I try to avoid having kind of arbitrary codes about like intonation or like if something is out of tune or out of time, like that in itself is not enough to like throw out for me. Because mm -hmm. a lot of great music might be conventionally out of tune in terms of like Western standards or Sure. might not might not be metronomic time or whatever the things that people can get really obsessive over in the studio and there's a place for that too depending on what kind of album you're making you know mm -hmm. but and i you know i i'm i'm always like really frustrated when i hear myself back and i'm you know intonation is a constant struggle and of course those things i think about and care about but at the end of the day i try not to let that you know um override just like what the music is and if the if the music is is happening then you can be then the 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 pitch or the you know the perfection of like where the beat is placed can i think can be a little bit more um, up in the air or open for interpretation i think that'll be heartening to uh 
anyone that anyone that's watching that plays or has ever played the violin because as you know pitch is like a <laughs> intonation i should say is a eternal struggle oh yeah and i mean it's it's not to say it's not important it's something i try to work on all the time but you know you that's what practicing is for is that's when you let yourself go down the rabbit hole and get obsessive about it but when it comes to making music you can't really be thinking about that i mean sometimes it does get in the way of good music yeah. but i feel right, like we, right, right. you can feel it right if something's just out of tune without any sort of soul or like intent behind it and it's just you know then that that, that can take take away from it but if you know if it's like if it's the other thing is a lot of fiddle players play like you know different styles of old time or texas style have different ways of interpreting pitch mm -hmm. and like playing like you know a lot of texas style fiddle players play slightly sharp and i love that and mm -hmm. they're definitely doing that on purpose because it's part of the sound you know mm -hmm. interesting uh well shifting gears just a little bit you mentioned just in passing like being in the recording studio we were talking about that do you have any recording projects that you're working on or are in the pipeline? I mean, yeah, it's most things are on hold right now, but um, I have been uh, in the process of going through mixes with uh, on this project that I recorded last summer with uh, Grant Gordy and Joe Walsh and Greg Garrison. It's just a it's nice. no one's like, you know, solo project. It's a uh, just a collaborative thing that that we we put together after uh, we all taught at the Sore Fingers Music Camp. In, oh, is that in England? Yeah, and you know, the four of us have all played together in different combinations, but not in that specific configuration. So we had a real good time playing, and ended up just going into the studio to record some tunes. It wasn't the kind of it wasn't a very like premeditated thing. It was just like, oh, let's document this chemistry, you know. That's awesome. So, I'm excited about that. Yeah. So I I would imagine that the release of that is all dependent on COVID and all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I think kind of that's that's why we ended up kind of getting the ball rolling again is because there's nothing else to do, you know. Yeah, I hear but, that. Um, I'm also trying to. This is from a few years ago, so as I'm sure all of you musicians know, is the more time passes, the harder it is to want to release music and put it out there. But my sister Tati and I recorded an EP a few years back in New York, and oh yeah, we're, we're I was at your release show. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Rockwood. totally. Yeah, great. Although it wasn't ever, we never actually released anything. But oh, really? We're, we're talking about it now, and it, it was such a kind of a spontaneous session that we we didn't even think about it. But all the tunes, except for like one that we may not even include in the final EP, they all happen to be in D. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't game. very uh, yeah, it wasn't very smart wrong. planning on our part. But it, you know, it's it's what it is. So we might just release it and call it something like you know. Alex and Tatiana playing the key of D or something. <laughs> Get straight to the point. You don't want there to yeah, be any yeah. confusion about what it is, right? <laughs> right. Well, uh, we had a question come in. I think this is probably a good, a good point uh, in the little interview to shift gears and take questions from people. Sure. Um, so if you're watching on Instagram, feel free to send questions. We have someone feeding us those questions. We're looking at like three different screens. So <laughs> sorry if we're not making eye contact. Um, or if you're the Zoom, uh, you can you can leave questions there. So we have a question here from Kenneth Stewart. Um, Alex, I don't know if you can see it. If you can't, I'll read it. But I don't think so. Oh, I, I can bring if it's in the chat window, I can bring it up. Oh yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, here. How about I read it out loud? Uh, Kenneth asks from the idea composing side. Have you ever experimented with spatial graphic notation? I'm thinking of artists like Anthony Braxton. An idea for ways of using classical music in a more flexible way than allows for spontaneous moments. Wow, what a cool question. And great question. the answer is no, I have not. But, um, and I'm not, I haven't listened to a lot of Braxton, but uh, my good friend Stash Weislouch is really into Braxton and has been studying his whole approach. And um, so kind of through Stash, I've, I've heard some, some of his music and I, I really like it a lot, but I don't know anything about that style of composing and I haven't experimented with it. That's it's a really funny cool idea though. I'm uh I've been telling myself for years I'm going to experiment with that. Like I actually am a cartoonist. Um, oh really? Cool. I have a that's a whole other side of me for another Zoom interview series I suppose, but 
um, I've, I just like to draw. And so I've been telling myself for years that I'm going to like do some drawings and then write music inspired, like maybe 10 drawings in each track is inspired from that. Um, Very cool. Yeah. Just to, like, I love that. Think outside the box. And some of you watching know uh, the great violinist, Zach Brock, who plays oh, yeah. in a band called Snarky Puppy. Um, I had a lesson with him actually a few weeks ago. Cool. And he gave me some great advice, which was, um, you know, in this con, he was talking about improvising, not necessarily composing, but it, it applies to composing too, which is like play in the style of a thing that is not music necessarily, like a okay. painting yeah. or a color or like, what is this, you know, what is angry sound like? What does disappointed sound like? You know, just right. trying to think outside the box, all these other ways and bring that into your music. So absolutely that's yeah that's such great stuff to think about and i i don't work on it enough it's the hardest thing to work on right because it's kind of this more abstract idea even though it's kind of at the foundation of what music is at least in a lot of this music we play as improvisers like expressing yourself that's like what it's all about and yet it's so hard to like isolate those things and actually work on them you know well it's interesting because like so many great pieces of music uh, you can you know, think of the planets by Holst or uh, yeah. a lot of like great jazz compositions were inspired by things that aren't music. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Like they're inspired by images or ideas. Um, I think, uh, yeah. do you know uh, Theo Croker? Great trumpet player. Oh yeah. Yeah. He has a whole album, everything on it. Uh, I can't remember the names of the tracks, but they're things like, Kind of like that John Coltrane album, A Love Supreme, names like Ascendance and yeah. you know, uh, Affirmation. And, and so right. it's, it's very philosophical and like you listen to it and you're like, wow, that sounds like transcendence <laughs> or whatever, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. whatever the word is. So totally. uh, thanks for that question, Kenneth. You've, the interview has taken yeah. a whole new dimension here. Are there any other questions from folks on Instagram or? Oh, and Kenneth even took the liberty of sending a document to the group. Awesome. Nice. Uh, cool. Love Supreme, right on. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry asked a question. Harry Taylor asks, you talk about intonation being a struggle and interpreting pitch. How about thoughts for fiddlers with hearing loss that can never be certain of intonation, a challenge that increases with each additional musician and the room or venue? Hmm. Um. Well, I'm, gosh, I'm not quite sure uh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of hearing loss and how to handle intonation, I, I'm not sure, honestly, what the best way is to go about work. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of musicians, I think, who have maybe have hearing damage who play really well in tune. So I'm sure there are ways to kind of get around that. Um, but yeah, yeah. I... I, I thought of something, Harry, if you know any musicians um, who you admire, who you know have also suffered hearing loss, you could pose this question to them. And I actually um, know of a great musician I can put you in touch with, Seamus Connolly, which if anyone out there is a fan of Irish fiddle, Seamus is a 10 time all Ireland champion. I think he actually holds the record with Brendan McGlinchey uh, for most all Ireland titles. And he literally can't hear in one ear. And it's, it's the ear oh, wow. closest to the fiddle. And he's been that way yeah, for decades. Yeah. Okay, um, wow. He's a great player. So anyway, I can, I can put you in touch with Seamus, Harry, if you're, if you're curious. I mean, I, I will say just in general for intonation, one thing that has been really helpful for me is practicing with drones. Mm. And that's kind of, I know it's a pretty like old idea of something to practice with, but it's a new thing for me that I've, kind of only been doing in the last four months or so and I've really been enjoying it. Uh, do you have those Daryl Anger drone recordings? Somewhere. I have the I had those for a long time ago and I remember I used them a while back and then I kind of fell off the wagon for a while and then um, just recently I kind of got back into it um, but through this app called uh, Tonal Energy um, which has like a um, like it's a drone app plus metronome and tuner. It's it's yeah. it's pretty great for practicing, and so that kind of got me back into it. I took a lesson with um, the pianist Aaron Parks, 
back in New York, like shortly before the pandemic. And uh-huh. he, he showed me some really cool exercises um, for working on ear training and modes with drones. So I kind of took that and also combined it with more of a violinistic approach to just to kind of work on intonation and that kind of thing. Awesome. Can you uh, say, say the name of that app one more time? Tonal Energy, T-E, I think it's just called T-E Tuner or something. T, Tonal Energy? Yeah. Okay. T- that, yeah, but Bet- between the Tonal Energy and Amazing Slowdown are the two, the two apps that I use all the time these days for practicing. I'm gonna put that one up too. Uh, awesome, we have a few more questions that just came in, so yeah. I wanna get to those while we have time. Um, one question is, this is from Instagram. Alex, how do you think about Boeing and jazz improv? Ooh, um, well, it's, it's a constant struggle. <laughs> I'm always trying to figure it out. Um, but, uh, I think it's, it's really about just trying to find a way that you can relate to the groove and feel like you can be, you know, that feel like you can swing and be a part of the rhythm section and with, you know, kind of through the path of least resistance and everyone finds their own way of doing it. I think there's certain, any, anyone who thinks there's like one like correct way of playing jazz violin, I think is, is maybe wrong in my opinion, um, because there's just not a whole lot of jazz violinists out there. So the mm-hmm. cool thing about that is there's, it, it gives you room to explore. And, you know, some people talk about the bebop bowing thing, which is like the hooked going bowing on the off beats. And that's good to a certain extent. I, I think it can be overdone too. But at the end of the day, like, I think just listen to Charlie Parker or Coltrane or Lester Young or whoever it is that inspires you and figure out how to apply that phrasing to the instrument, you know? And you, over time, I think you'll find common patterns that you, that you, you know, you might hear in, in uh, some of these horn players mm-hmm. that you can adapt. I mean, I like the whole idea, again, to go back to Billy Contreras and also uh, Chris Howes, both of them I feel like have found really cool ways of using the bow more like a breath. Mm. So not necessarily always having to like re-articulate following any sort of bowing pattern, but kind of thinking mm. more in terms of like these long flowing lines that you can do in, in one bow. So kind of like going against the idea of you know, in classical music, often violets talk about avoiding s- slurs across strings mm-hmm. and one thing that's been really helpful for me is actually trying to embrace that a little more mm. and sometimes yeah there's a reason why people talk about not slowing across strings because it, it can slow you down and kind of make the line jagged in a, in a weird way that you may not want but um i found that it's also been really helpful getting comfortable with that so when you're transcribing some of these players you mentioned, like Stuff Smith and Eddie South and Ray Nance or Grappelli, um, how conscious are you of the Boeings and incorporating that into your own jazz language? Yeah, uh, it, it really depends. Like, I mean, I'm always conscious of it, but I'm not always conscious of it to the point of like literally trying to transcribe the Boeings. Mm-hmm. But at least like I'll just play along with it over and over again and and try to really kind of just, you know, get into the vibe of how they're playing it. And sometimes that might include figuring out a specific bowing, but often it's more just kind of like, like I I can hear if I'm not fully like locking in with how they're feeling the rhythm. And often that has to do with the bowing, you know? Mm. Right. Um, But I did, uh, when I was, I was working on some Charlie Parker recently, and that was, that was really interesting to kind of get, to check out the way he was slurring lines more and and the way he was kind of combining groupings of twos and three note slurs. And um, that was really informative. Interesting. We'll have to compare transcriptions one of these days. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) That'd be fun. Um, Another question that came in, how old were you when you started? Um, I got my first fiddle when I was three messed around on it for a little while and then started taking lessons when I was four. Wow. I feel like that's pretty, pretty early. And this is Suzuki, right? Yeah. Suzuki slash just kind of whatever. I mean, I, I'm, that's one thing I'm really grateful for. You know, my parents were very encouraging of me just exploring and playing and not, you know, 
they wanted to find good teachers for me, but they 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 didn't have any sort of mission to make sure I stuck with like classical or any sort of one style in a rigid way, you know. Yeah. No, I I've met your dad, and I can say he's oh he's yeah very, very supportive. <laughs> very proud of you. Needless to say, <laughs> it was actually weird because I didn't know he I did not know he was your dad, and I mentioned you. I think I told you this. Oh right, it was you were playing that at that club, and yeah. His band was like uh, sharing the stage with us. Okay. Or no, it wasn't his band. He was just there. Uh, okay. But his friends were in the band. And, uh, and we were talking. And I think he said his son was a violinist. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I lived in New York and I knew a lot of great players. And do you know this guy, Alex Hargraves? It's like, yeah, that's my <laughs> son. He's <It's> amazing. <laughs> great. Um, so are there any other questions? Uh, someone, uh, so Kenneth Stewart, for you violin players out there, we can share this on Instagram too, maybe, uh, if our helper behind the scenes, whose name is Chris, she does have a name. Um, if Chris wants to share this link with the, the folks on Instagram, it might be beneficial to them. Someone sent a link for Daryl Inger's, Daryl Anger's drones. We were talking about that, yeah. uh, which is super helpful. And Harry, uh, who asked a question about you know, hearing loss and practicing. That might be helpful for, for you, Harry, to just play along with those drones. Um, but yeah, so while, while I leave it open for oh, one more question, Alex, what are you shedding now? What do you listen to? Oh, okay, let's see. Well, I'll start with the shedding. Uh, most recently, I was, I've been really getting back into learning solos, transcribing. When I say transcribing, I don't necessarily mean writing out. Sometimes it includes that, but um, it's something that I kind of neglected for for a few years, with a few exceptions. But I've been trying to use this pandemic time to get back into that, and it's been really inspiring. So uh, most recently, I was I've been working on um, Louis Armstrong's version of Stardust, his solo on or like his the opening solo on Stardust. Wow, I was studying Louis Armstrong yesterday. That's why. Oh, I nice. Was yeah, up. yeah. Um, I mean, he's obviously the man. He's yeah. where it all where it all started. So, um, and I haven't studied him nearly enough. So, I'm, that's been really inspiring for me. Um, what else? Checking out. I mean, I'm always always checking out different fiddle players and going through different phases with that. But um, you know, Kenny Baker, I always come back to. So, I was recently learning some more Kenny tunes. I've been loving Vassar Clements is playing on um the complete Olden in the Way like boarding mm. house tapes which again I grew up with that music but I can't get enough of it and Vassar's playing on it it's just absolutely incredible he's kind of like I would have to think that like Vassar I mean he's inspiring for so many fiddlers but for you I mean he just must be in your like CD player all the time because he incorporates all these things that you're passionate about musically yeah, I, I, he just has such a unique voice, you know, and you hear him play with Bill Monroe when he was like a teenager or however young he was on like that right. um, Mule Skinner blues recording and like, and and then you hear how his playing changed over the years and he, he just has such a unique voice and I feel like he's just kind of symbolic to me of like, like what an ideal, like the ideal fiddle player because he yeah. really kind of transcends a lot of like this kind of invention, conventional ideas of what makes a fiddle player good or like playing in tune or whatever those things are. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, he has incredible pitch and tone, but he's also, he blurs the lines of what's considered to be like, you know, conventional. And that's what, I love musicians like that. Those are my favorite kinds of musicians. And, yeah, um, I mean, uh, so Alex and I met at Fiddle Week actually, which is a part of this, if you can read yeah. this, the Gathering, uh, which is a series of music workshops in North Carolina. And so we met at Fiddle Week, but the very first Fiddle Week, Vassar was on staff. Oh, wow. And I remember uh, my dad and I, we picked him up at the airport. Really? And he had a bright orange fiddle case, like neon orange fiddle case, and the biggest Incredible. belt buckle, the biggest belt buckle I'd ever seen. I mean, that <laughs> already said so much, and the hair, of course, yeah. you know. Like, he just already such an individual, without even opening his, is uh his fiddle case yeah oh i love that that's so great 
Yeah, I, yeah. I got to meet him once when I was pretty young. I went and saw, saw him play, um, but I never got to spend time with him. But from everything I've heard from talking to people and from reading things and seeing pictures, he just seemed like such a humble person who was always down to play with whoever, too. He didn't have some yeah. weird, like, chip on his shoulder or, like, kind of weird elitist ego thing going on. Like, he was just always down to, like, play with people. And that, that is also, like, just as inspiring to me. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's, yeah. Yeah. It's all because that's, that's kind of what it's all about at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, like, you see him playing with people that are 50 years younger than him, you know. Right, right. Like, on where, you know, he's the fiddler in the band, and he's 50 years older than everyone else, you know. Yeah, yeah. People like Jerry Garcia, even, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, definitely an inspiration in a lot of ways. Uh, well, cool. I mean, I've asked you all of my questions that I had prepared. Cool. Um, <laughs> but if there are no other questions, I think we can end it here. And... Um, one thing I'll just mention real quickly uh, before I introduce who's going to be on, who's going to be in the hot seat next in two weeks. But one thing that we have been trying to do in the last few interviews is raise awareness for some organization that uh, does great work that is certainly affected by COVID-19, like everyone in the arts community. And um, so for this particular interview, we couldn't find a donate button for them. Um, but there's Alex is from Corvallis, Oregon. And there's this organization called the Corvallis Folklore Society, which you suggested, Alex. Uh, maybe you want yeah. to tell people just a little bit about what that organization does. Yeah, well, they're, they've always been a really big part of the community around here that I was very grateful to grow up in. And, um, you know, whether it's promoting shows, bringing artists to town, or just hosting workshops or kind of local events, they're, they're just, a, they're a, they're doing a lot of really great things for the community here. And um, I'm very grateful for, for what, what they did and all their help, you know, growing up. So I'll just put Corvallis Folklore Society here in the chat. And if our uh, behind the scenes helper wants to plop a link down there for people, that would be great. Um, you can go check out what they do and even become a member if you so desire. Um, so the next, the next interview, the next Musicians Workbench interview will be in two weeks. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that date. It's a Friday, though. Uh, they always are. Uh, the 28th. Friday, August 28th, we'll have Jason Anik. Oh, and nice. Great. Yeah, Jason, I know, is, is a good longtime friend of Alex's. and Yeah. He's an amazing swing, jazz, bluegrass. I think he plays lots of stuff, but probably yeah. best, best known for his jazz and swing specifically, and he plays with a group called Rhythm Future Quartet, uh, which is an amazing group. So if you can't get enough of the jazz fiddle talk, come back <laughs> in two weeks. We got more for you. Never enough of that. Never enough. <laughs> yes, me. Um, but there's a lot of other great interviews. I, I actually, the response to this has just been overwhelming, Alex. I can't tell you. Like, I, I probably, I emailed like 20 fiddlers that I admire, not just fiddlers, mostly fiddlers. And almost every single one of them said yes. Uh, and so I'm like booked till the end of the year. You know, this is so great. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of great people, uh, including Zach Brock, who, who oh, I cool. mentioned. Yeah. And Chris Howes. Alex mentioned Chris Howes. Nice. He'll, be, he'll be here as well. So, um, yeah, I would encourage folks to just check out my Facebook page, Andrew Finn McGill Music, to find out when those other interviews are. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in, everyone, on Instagram and Sorry for the technical difficulties. That's never happened. We were two for three with the Facebook Live. So maybe next, maybe in two weeks, we'll have better luck. But anyway, thanks for everyone uh, with your questions on Instagram and Zoom. And if you have any other questions for Alex, you can send it to him on his, uh, I guess, Instagram or Facebook yeah. page. Or... Absolutely. Sweet. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Finn. It's yeah, nice thank you, Alex. Don't don't Good leave pleasure. just yet, Alex. Just yeah, stick around for a hot second. But uh, I'm gonna end the uh, the Zoom here for everyone. So thanks, thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.